Hey, what's up, you guys? Welcome back to BTM to the Basketball Time Machine, the show with former NBA players about former NBA players. Before we get to today's guest, just a reminder, if you want to hear more podcasts like this one, just make sure you hit that subscribe button and click the notifications button so you always get notified once we upload a new podcast. All right, today's guest is a player that I really admired back in the days, one of my favorite players of the 1990s. Dale Ellis, welcome to the show. Thank you. Glad to be on your show. Dale, the first question, do you remember when you started to play basketball? Well, I I grew up in government housing, so, you know, I was athletic uh, as a youngster. It didn't matter what we were doing, playing sandlock football, baseball, basketball, um, racing from here to there. You know, we're, we're, we played all day long, so I, I gravitated towards basketball because I really enjoyed that game above all. So I, I started getting into it maybe around 9 or 10 years old. started getting real active with that game. I, jo- I enjoyed playing it. Do you remember who introduced you to the game? No, I'm just, just uh, I grew up in a neighborhood, a ton of kids, so, you know, we, we play games and all day long. So no one actually introduced me to the game. All right. But who was your favorite player back in the day? Well, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was my favorite player. <laughs> you know, I think all kids go on the playground and try to emulate uh, well, heroes. And I, I looked at Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. So I first started playing basketball. I was throwing the hook shot. Oh, wow. I had to learn how to put my left hand, left hand on the ball to take shots. But I was just throwing the ball up there, but I was enjoying playing the, ball, playing the game and watching the ball go in. Did you ever tell him? I did not. I did not. You know, I was drafted into the NBA in 1983 and had gone through training camp and a few exhibition games and the season had started. We were probably a month into the season and we were playing the Lakers. I got off the bench to play the Lakers and stood next to Kareem and man, I was in awe. <laughs> I was in awe. Just, yeah, I was tongue tied. You know, I, it, it's funny because at that moment, I it snapped that I'm Realized my dream of being a professional basketball player. It's come true. But I had already been around for a while. I had been drafted. But it finally dawned on me. My dream came true. I'm playing with some of the best players that ever played the game basketball. Absolutely. Oh, you just mentioned you were drafted by the Dallas Mavericks in 1983 um, with the ninth pick. Now, in hindsight, if you had the chance to be drafted by a different team, would you change or would you stick with the Dallas Mavericks? Um... The Mavericks wasn't a good fit for me. You know, I, I spent the first three years playing with Dallas and didn't get the opportunity I wanted. Um, it was difficult. So mm-hmm. practice time was actually play time for me. I look forward to going to practice every single day to work on my game. You can get lost in the shuffle, if you know, with the right team and the right system. And I saw it go in that direction. So I, I just continued to work and stay positive and waited for an opportunity. After three years, it was time to make a move. You know, he just uh, requested a trade. I was happy to land in, in Seattle. Where I had a group of guys that were, well, they were rebuilding that team. They were rebuilding, and there uh, was no pressure of winning. And I was given the opportunity. Coach put me in the starting lineup and told me to shoot the basketball. That's why you're here. I want you to put it in the air every time you get a chance to. So just uh, being in the right system, playing for the right coaches, uh or give you that confidence that you can get it done. You can go play basketball. Uh, the Mavericks back in the days had a really great team. I mean, uh, Mark Aguirre, Rolando Blackman. I was just wondering, why did they actually draft you if you're not the, the right pick for them? I didn't, I didn't get it because they had scores already. Well, throughout high school and college, I was forced to play with my back to the basket. So I was actually drafted into the NBA as a poster player, small forward. But oh, in, wow. in college, I was defending uh, some centers, like a Rap Sampson or a Sam Bowie. Uh, I couldn't defend wow. guys like a Charles Barkley, too big and too strong down low. But um, So I defended guys from the, the two position all the way to the five position. But I was a post-up player. Um, the Mavericks had no idea that I could shoot from the perimeter. I, was, I did exactly what my coaches asked me to do. And uh, Don DeVoe was my college coach. He saw that I could help the team best by playing in the paint. So that's where he put me. So I gave it 100% there. But in the off season, I would always work on my being able to shoot the ball from the perimeter. When I got to Seattle, uh, Bernie knows that very well. So he adjusted me from the post to uh, the two position, took me off the post, off the block, and 
gave me an opportunity to go play. And they set up plays for me to get shot, get me involved. And I had teammates who, you know, would sacrifice the game to get, get me involved. That Sonics team was really interesting. I mean, you had guys like Tom Chambers, Eddie Johnson, yourself, Xavier McDaniel. Um, and that season, you actually won the, the Most Improved Player Award. Um, how much did it mean to you? It meant a lot. You know, I have the biggest increase in points from one year to the next in NBA history. It just proved that I, I, I deserved an opportunity to play in Dallas. I wanted to prove prove some people wrong. I, like I said earlier, you, you can sit on that bench. You can lose confidence in your ability to play that game. And coaches will sometimes make you feel like you're, you're not good enough to be there. I didn't want that. So I, I look forward to going to practice, working hard, and just continuing to work on the opportunity, wait for that opportunity to come. And uh, was there finally giving it to me in uh, Seattle. And I took full advantage of it. I took full advantage of it. So in your second season with the Sonics, they actually draft Scottie Pippen and yeah, trade him away right after. Honestly, did he ever think about, okay, what could have been if Pippen would have stayed? I mean, we're talking about yourself, Scottie Pippen, Gary Payton, Sean Kemp. That just sounds like championship rings to me. Honestly, did you ever think about it again? Yeah, you try not to. You know, each year there's uh, new guys coming in, guys leaving. It's not, you try not to think about uh, decisions that the uh, general manager or the coaches get together and make on who they're going to select to be your teammates. You just concentrate on playing basketball. And whatever guys does that you're surrounded with, that's your team. So you just got to go out and give them 110%. But there were opportunities to bring in, in players that they skipped on, like uh, Scotty Pippen would have been fun to play with. He ended up in... Um, in Chicago with the Bulls and won multiple championships. But uh, Scotty had an opportunity to come down to Sean and with Gary. I mean, that, uh, that's some awesome talent to play with. It was taking a lot of pressure off my game. It made the game a lot easier. So in 1989, you actually make your first also appearance, which is crazy because the season prior, you put up incredible numbers, but it just proves how loaded the NBA was back in the days. Um, do you remember your feelings on that day or, or yeah, in general how you felt knowing that you actually made the All-Star team? I, I can't I can't remember back. What I do remember about that All-Star weekend, I was I was nervous. I've always been nervous uh, stepping on the, on the court. I had butterflies. And I had to work with that, you know. So I, I just uh, try to play as hard as I could and get, get it out of my system. But, but and, and when you play in this game for as long as I did, you'll get the understanding. It, it, it's, it's, The butterflies are going to be there. It's not that you're nervous about the guy as long as you like it, so Michael Jordan. At the end of the day, if you put in a 110% on the practice floor, it, now it's just a matter of can you bring it to the game. That's all. So you you are actually competing against yourself. So that was my attitude. Every time I stepped on the floor, I'm see if I can bring it. But that, that all-star experience was uh, unbelievable. Uh, it was Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's last year in the league. And um, he didn't make the All-Star team. Um, Magic Johnson did. Magic made the team. I thought, okay, I'll get the chance to play with the best point guard ever, Magic Johnson. I was excited about, about that, but he gave up his spot for Kareem to play because it was Kareem last year. So then I go to the locker room, and uh, my locker is right next to to Kareem's and I was a <laughs> childhood hero Kareem Abdul-Jabbar I couldn't believe it and the media was all over and because this is last year playing this is last year playing basketball and uh, it, it's, it's funny to think back I was so nervous I didn't say one word to him but hi how you doing that's it I didn't have a conversation with him I regret that because I know what type of guy he is now You know, that he's approachable. Oh, wow. Man, this is so special. You know, I just try to imagine you as a little child hooping, trying to imitate Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and fast forward 20 years later or 15 years later, you actually play with him. It's It just proves that you can get anywhere. You can make, make everything happen once you put your mind to it and you put the work into it. That's right. And uh, I was fortunate. I believe I played in the best era of basketball. You know, you had Michael, Magic, Bird, Kareem. <laughs> Julie Zerman, I saw all those guys, Moses Malone, even Kobe came in, I was still an active player. I've seen some great players come and go in that game. Good that you mentioned that because that actually would have been one of my next questions. Um, let's say you have a time machine and you could play in any era you want. Would you still want to play in the same era you played in or would it be a different one? Um, you know, if you look at the way the game is played right now, 
it's, it's more conducive to my style of play. Uh, there's, yeah, there's no such thing as a bad shot in the NBA anymore. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're looking to shoot threes, and if you're seven foot tall, they're looking for guys that actually can score from the perimeter. It doesn't matter your size now. But the game is so much freer. If you watch Golden State plays, the coach just turns a little so they go play, go have fun. That's how you want to play basketball. So I, I, it's more conducive to my game. It would have been a lot easier for me to play that way. But it was a more structured game when I was playing it. You know, the, there was no such thing as a three-point shot when I came into the league. They had just implemented the three-point shot. So I didn't play with it in high school or college. There was no three-point line. When I got into the NBA, they were only using that three-point line at the end of the half or the end of the game. So you go into the locker room up, you can get on going to the locker room up with some confidence, or you have to shoot that shot towards the end of the game to win it. Yeah, actually, good that you mentioned that because that would have been one of my next questions. Um, you competed plenty of times in the uh, three-point shoot-up, and uh, nowadays it seems like stars, yeah, they are more afraid of actually damaging their brand instead of competing in those contests. Um, yeah, your generation was totally different back then. Right. Um, it was, um, I guess back then it was building, we were building the league. At the same time, you were entertaining the fans, giving them what they wanted. So I had a lot of attention in that area. I'd get called from the league to come particip to participate. And uh, I didn't turn those opportunities down. Like you said, guys uh, don't want to hurt their brand. They won't get into a dunk contest. Uh, but uh, we didn't look at basketball that way. It wasn't about a brand. Branding was something totally different. Uh, yeah, guys like Michael Jordan and Dominique Wilkins in a dunk contest when you won't see Kobe Bryant or LeBron James do it ever, you know? So you're not worried about a brand. You just go to do it. Do it. As you're giving back to the game and you're giving the fans what they want to see. Yes, man, absolutely. And it's great to hear your opinion on that because um, me as a basketball fan, I actually have a hard time watching today's game and I'm not hating on today's game, but it's just, yeah, not as great as it used to be, not not as much fun as it used to be. And, and yeah, I'm so disappointed that the stars don't understand the obligation, obligation to give the fans what they want because the game is also about the fans, you know? Yeah, that's right. The fans make the game. Without them, there's no game. It was easy for me to get up for uh, playing against uh, Chicago Bulls or, or Michael Jordan. It was, that, was, that was easy. The most difficult thing for me playing ball was to get up for teams like uh, a Kobe Bryant. Not a Kobe Bryant, I'm sorry, but uh, Clippers, LA Clippers. They had the worst team in the league at the time. But, you know, when you're playing against, you're playing against Michael, the arena's going to be full, the fans are going to be excited. That's what the environment you want to be in. People come out to watch you. You can really enjoy playing playing the game. That was my funnest time. Really. The arenas were packed. We had great fans in Seattle. Oh, yes, for sure. Absolutely. And Seattle still needs an NBA team, but that's a different story for another episode. Um, let's say, because you mentioned the Clippers, let's say you have a time machine and uh, we go back and for whatever reason, you get traded to the Los Angeles Clippers in the mid-90s where they really were not the greatest team, let's put it that way. Um, how would you how would you dealt with that situation being on a really bad team? God, it's it difficult. You know, my first coach, Dick Mata, said that, um, you know, great players might have one or two games they can't get up for. You know, playing with the Clippers and, and being in an environment where you're not winning it's, it's difficult you know i've always been on a winning program i've never been on a losing program so i don't really know how i would handle that situation when you get, get into basketball i think we all do we got in because we enjoyed playing the game and we wanted to win and my goal was to play for a championship you know i was never the closest i ever gotten was the western conference finals and we lost to the lakers and the lakers went on to win the nba championship that year are you talking about the spurs No, I was actually in Seattle. My first year in Seattle. Yep. First year there. We had a, we had 10 new players on that team. They were rebuilding. And uh, we came together towards the end of the season. We were picked to lose more games than anybody in the league that year. And we ended up winning half our games. Uh, 41 games, losing 41 games, something like that. It squeaked into the playoffs. We were at number eight seed. And we were facing the Dallas Mavericks, my former team. And... Uh, Yeah, and they had the best record in the league right here. They were number one seed. 
and we ended up knocking them out of playoffs, and we uh, beat Houston and, and lost to the Lakers. The Lakers went on to win it all, but uh, you know, to play for a championship, an NBA championship, the excitement in the air, and see if you can perform. The majority of NBA basketball games are won and lost in the last two minutes. That's what I would really like to tune in and watch. Watch NBA basketball. That's when you can see who can play and who can't play. In championship series, it's the same thing. Who can get it done when the game's on the line? Because you have to raise your game to a whole nother level. Well, you play for really good teams, uh, especially the Spurs in the mid 90s were pretty good. I think David Robinson was still in his prime. Yeah. And... David Robinson, we had uh, Dennis Robin come in. David Johnson, David Johnson was the point guard. Um, Sean Elliott. The, the two down the play three position. Yeah, we had a nice team. Antoine Carr coming off the bench. We were very competitive. We've had some good players. Well, I wasn't able to get it done, you know. And I uh, ended up leaving, going to Denver uh, with Bernie Bickerstaff. I re reunited with Bernie Bickerstaff. He was the general manager there. And playing with the Kimbe, you know, I thought that was, they were up and coming team, a young team. Uh, that I thought could do something. And I was going to take a six-man role, come off the bench. And I had been a starter. So it was no big deal for me to come off the bench. I really wanted to be on the winning program, play for a championship. And I thought they were going to be able to get it done there in Denver, but we weren't able to. Okay, what year are we talking about? No, you would ask me that question. <laughs> <laughs> so many years, I lose track of them all. But, you know... The, the, yeah, I think you had Brian Stiff and uh, Lafonso Ellis. There you go. Yeah, Robert Pack, my old Abdul Raouf, one of the greatest shooters ever played a game that never gets his attention. Oh, yes. One of the most underrated players in NBA history. That guy could shoot. I mean, he's killing Ice Cube's big three league uh, at the moment. But, yeah, that man was the bomb. Absolutely. Yeah, he could flat out shoot it. When a game was on the line and uh, we needed the basket and coach called timeout, we would always look at each other, smile, and wonder, who the coach is going to call this play for. So it, it didn't matter. If he called it for me, he was, my mood had my back. He was excited about that. And vice versa. He called the play for my mood. And my mood was the only player I've ever played with that I had confidence in making that shot. So if he didn't call that play for me to shoot it, my mood in his hands, I felt just as confident that he, he's going to shoot it and he's going to give us an opportunity to win the game. In your long lasting NBA career, What was the team where you actually had the most fun? I'm not talking about being the most successful, but just in general, the time that you enjoyed the most. I would have to say Seattle. You know, I kept a home there for 20 years. Uh, I played for other teams and go back to Seattle during the off-season. So I love Seattle. I love the people there. It's diverse. The food is awesome, off the chain. But, uh, but more importantly, the guys. You know, there was a group of guys came in year after year. And we were close-knit. We're a close-knit group, and uh, so I, I enjoyed playing with those guys. Did you get along with Xavier McDaniel? Uh, Xavier McDaniel? Yes. You know, it's just, he has some up and downs with teammates, but Xavier and I are friends to this day. You know, we, we had an altercation that took place, it was unfortunate that it happened, but those things, not, they kind of happened, but uh, I got along with all my teammates. And didn't, didn't Michael Cage play on your team? Yeah, Michael Cage came in. And uh, play with us. Yeah, that was um, a good team. Yes, we've we've had some some awesome talent. You know, we had uh, uh, Nate McMillan as a point guard, and David and Tom Chambers, myself, was averaging 20 plus points a game. And I don't believe anybody was doing that at that time when you had three guys on the team scoring that way. All right, Dale, you retired in the year 2000, and what have you been doing since? Or even more interesting, what are you doing at the moment? Any current projects that you're working on? Well, I am I'm president of the Atlanta chapter of the Retired Player Association. So my job is to that uh, you have about 50 to 60 retired players living throughout the Atlanta area. They're not all members, uh, so I, I recruit them to membership. We put events together. We come to group as uh, come together as a group and decide what we want to allocate monies out into the community. It's challenging work. It's challenging. It's, it's been difficult to get some players uh, engaged in doing the work, but it's fun. It's rewarding work. So I'm enjoying doing that, enjoying giving back. So that's what my life is about. And I just recently uh, created a company, Gangs, 
Face Sports Influencer Agency with Brian Jordan and uh, Christopher Amerson. I don't know if you know Brian. Brian is a retired NFL slash baseball. So he, he played dual sports, baseball and football for here in Atlanta. So we're working together. So I'm enjoying that. And it's just about uh, connecting current and former professional athletes with brands and ad agencies. So um, this is this is new. It's, um, it's exciting. And uh, I got a good group, uh, Christopher Amerson. That's unbelievable. I mean, he's an awesome talent. He's one of those guys that stays in front of the computer all day long. So he's the whiz behind it all. Dale Ellis, it was great to have you on the show. I appreciate you. Thank you, Sean, for having me. All right, fellas, that was the podcast with NBA legend Dale Ellis. As you can hear, a really nice guy. And I'm glad to say that his personality actually matches his playing style. All right, you guys, see you next time.